We turn to the word and our scripture reading this morning is from Romans chapter 3 from verse 19 to 31. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For behold, that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one. Who will justify the, who will justify the, the, the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. To many people, the Bible is an excellent handbook for life. There are some wonderful life lessons to be found in its pages. Even many non-Christians would agree that it contains some excellent teachings on how we should behave and how we should treat each other and all of those kind of things. The Bible, though, is not a collection of disconnected stories, each with a little bit of wisdom here and there on how to live our lives. Rather, it is a single story with three main themes. Firstly, it tells us what's wrong with mankind. Then it tells us what God has done in order to make it right. And then finally, it reveals how history is going to turn out in the end. I don't know if you've ever thought of that. That's the main theme of the Bible, just under three headings. Now, some biblical scholars agree that the 13 verses that we've just read is quite possibly the most important passage in the book of Romans. In fact, Martin Luther called it the chief point and the very central place of the epistle and of the whole Bible. And when we consider what came out of the Reformation and how it shaped the teaching and preaching of the early reformers, this particular passage of scripture took center stage and it became the central teaching and focus of the Reformed Church. And one of the five solas of the Reformation was the statement that we are saved by faith alone, sola fide. And they tirelessly proclaimed that salvation does not come from our own works of righteousness, but rather by looking beyond ourselves to the person and the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, became the rallying cry of the Reformers as they drew the Reformed Church back to the authority of the Bible. And we began this series as we looked at that, Sola Scriptura, the authority of the Bible alone. And that was the basis and the foundation of what they believed and what they taught. And central to the teaching of the Bible is that our salvation is a gift of grace. This is what we looked at last Sunday. And that grace comes to us by faith, which is our theme for this morning. And those two words, grace and faith, belong together. Because they answer the most important question we could ever ask. How can a sinful person be made right with God? Romans 3 verse 20 tells us how we are not reconciled to God. By the works of the law, no human being will be satisfied in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. This works of the law is what is also known as works righteousness. And at the foundation of the human condition is the struggle that we have for righteousness. Because every human being knows instinctively that there is something desperately wrong within us. Deep within ourselves, there is something wrong. Some deny that reality, but Paul addresses that attitude in Romans 1 verse 18. When he says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The truth is there, staring them in their faces, 
But because of their unrighteousness and sin, they've chosen to suppress and ignore the truth. It's not that they don't believe in God. They won't believe in God. That's the choice that they have made. So then where does this instinctive desire to be reconciled with God come from? Just as, as a child yearns for acceptance and approval from their parents, so we long for a sense of acceptance, approval, security and significance. It comes to us from God. We want to be accepted by our fellow human beings, by our teachers, by our parents, by our peers. We all want acceptance. But ultimately we want acceptance from God, whether we believe that to be true or not. And that comes to us from God. We were designed by God to find these things, this acceptance and righteousness in Him. The emptiness we all sense within us can never be filled and satisfied by worldly things. It is only God who gives us the fullness that we need. Jesus said in John 10 verse 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And that's what God gives to us. The great problem we have is that our sin has separated us from God. So now instead of turning to Him for our significance and sense of purpose, we go after the things of the world. They may bring temporary satisfaction, but they never last. And this is what Paul was talking about in Romans 10 verse 3. Being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. And there's our problem. We seek to establish our own righteousness, while at the same time we will not submit to the righteousness of God. And that lies at the very heart of the human condition. We need God. He created that need within us, but in our sinful state we want nothing to do with Him. Because we are enemies of God, we reject Him, but that creates all kinds of problems in our own lives and in the world in general. Why is the world in such a mess? It's because we've rejected God. In Him we will find our purpose, and in Him we will find the solution for every human problem, without exception. But that means having to humble ourselves and admitting that He was right and we were wrong. And we don't want to do that. Instead, we try to fix the problems ourselves, but this only compounds the problems. It doesn't solve it, because as Paul wrote, in our sinful state, we are ignorant of the righteousness of God. Trying to make ourselves right with God by works of righteousness simply does not work. Our attempts to obey the law are doomed to fail because we are born in sin. And that means that our very nature is at war with the law of God. With the one glaring exception of the Christian faith, every other religion, which were all invented by sinners, all other religions teach that there are laws which need to be obeyed. The great irony is that most non-Christians often say that the Bible is a list of do's and don'ts. The truth is it's the exact opposite. It is the other religions that publish rule books, not Christianity. If you think the Bible is a list of do's and don'ts, you don't understand what the Word of God really is all about. Salvation comes to us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Not by our futile attempts to do all the right things and in trying to be the best that we can be. That's what all the other religions do. So the question is, why do works of law not save us? Because relying on our obedience to the law in order to be saved requires perfect obedience. The pass mark is 100%. Not 99.999%, but 100%. God is perfect and He is holy. And if we are going to obey the law in order for Him to accept us, we need to be perfectly holy as He is, and we need to obey His law perfectly. And that then faces us with the problem we're all born with. We are born in sin. So it's not extremely difficult to obey the law of God perfectly. It is impossible. We are born dead in our sins and our transgressions. We are born condemned to hell. And that's why we need a Savior outside of ourselves. Because we can't save ourselves. Our sin leaves us legally guilty before God. And no amount of good works can repair the damage that we've done. So the first part of Romans 3 verse, 10, 3 verse 20 teaches that works righteousness does not save us. And in the second half of that verse, 
Paul tells us what the perfect law does. Through the law comes knowledge of sin. So again, the law doesn't save us. Rather, it condemns us. It stands in judgment against us. God's law is perfect. It is holy and it is glorious because it's a reflection of his nature. But when sinners are exposed to the perfect, holy and glorious law of God, all it does is show us just how messed up we really are. So how then can we be saved? After giving us the bad news in verses 19 and 20, Paul goes on to give us the good news in the next six verses. But now, you see, there's that transition. You often see it in Paul's writings. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. We need the righteousness of God to be given to us in order to make us acceptable to him. And this is exactly what he has done for us through Jesus. And the vessel, the means of transferring or imputing that righteousness to us is faith. In faith we believe we are saved. Not only that, but the faith we place in God is not our own faith because our faith is weak and it cannot be trusted. True saving faith is a gift that we have been given. As we well know, our faith fluctuates depending on the circumstances in our lives at any given time. So, and this is so important, not only does our salvation depend on what God has done for us, but the faith to believe in him is also a gracious gift which he gives to us. Sometimes we feel like we're barely holding on to the promises of God by our fingernails. Life is like that. Our faith is tested every day. And if we're entirely honest, we would all admit there are times that we don't even feel like we're saved. We all struggle with doubts. But here is the good news. Our salvation does not depend on us holding on to God. If it did, we'd all be in serious trouble. Our salvation depends on God holding on to us. We've just sung those words, great is thy faithfulness. So God not only saves us, but he provides the faith that we need in order to believe that we are, in fact, saved. So the next time that you are struggling with doubts about God and you feel like your faith is letting you down, remember this. The faithfulness of God will never let you down. You may feel like you are a million miles away from him. But if you have confessed with your own mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, if you are a Christian saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, then God is holding you firmly in his hand, despite what you may be thinking. Or what you may be feeling. And he will not let you go. You are his and you are his for all of eternity. Our salvation does not depend on what we think or on what we feel. Our salvation depends on the facts of history. And the facts are that Christ has died, Christ is risen and one day Christ will come again. Remember the cross. Remember why it was so necessary and remember what God did for you there. Because he is righteously angry at us because of our sin. We deserve his wrath. We deserve his condemnation. We all deserve to be sentenced to hell. But in grace, God sent Jesus to pay the penalty for our sin. And as Paul wrote about Jesus in Romans 3 verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. The blood of Christ has set you free. The cross was necessary for our salvation because of the justice of God. He cannot and he simply he will not turn the other way and pretend our sin doesn't matter. Then he would be denying his very nature. A price had to be paid because the justice of God had to be satisfied. So he sent Jesus to die. And as he died, our sin and our condemnation was, ex it was, it was exchanged for his perfect righteousness. Where we have failed to keep the law of God, Jesus kept it perfectly. 
And it is because of this that God declares those who believe in Christ to be righteous in His sight. The cross is not just a, a, a place where Jesus shows us the love of God. It's also a place where the justice of God was satisfied. It's at the cross where we see God's love and God's justice coming together. And Jesus offers us more than just forgiveness. He gives us justification. Somebody once put it this way. Forgiveness says you may go. You've been set free from your penalty. Justification says I want you to stay. You are welcome to stay in my presence. And it's only when we grasp the doctrine of justification that we will understand that we are accepted by God once more. It's only when we are justified by faith in Christ that we will finally find this acceptance and this, this significance that we all yearn for. Because as God declares us to be righteous in His eyes, we are given Jesus' perfect record. God accepts us because even though we have broken the law, Jesus upheld the law on our behalf. It's not that we become righteous enough for God to accept us. Rather, He declares us to be righteous even while we were sinful, ungodly, and His enemies. Despite all of that, he declares us to be righteous because of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Martin Luther called it a passive righteousness. It's the biblical truth that God has not only forgiven us our sin, but he has credited to us the righteousness of Jesus. Because that's the only thing that can save us. So we are passive recipients of the righteousness of Christ because he has done it all for us. Romans 3, 21 and 22 again. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And the faith to believe this is a gift which God provides for us. You remember when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, God said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The gospel message is that God is pleased with us, not because of anything we are or we have done, but because he is pleased with Jesus. He is pleased with his son. We, when we put our faith in his son, he accepts us and he is pleased. And the good news is that all of this comes not through us simply doing anything, but simply by faith. Sola fide. Faith alone is the key to receiving the righteousness of God or to be justified. Faith is the means which God chose by which the righteousness of Christ becomes ours. Faith is the instrument by which we receive the righteousness of Jesus. And it is through faith alone. Sola fide. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul lists various spiritual gifts. And if you read that chapter, you'll see that one of those gifts is faith. And it is this gift which God gives to all believers. Now, why is it so important for us to understand that we receive the gift of salvation by faith alone? It's because faith means that we are receiving something, not doing something, not being something or someone. So when we say we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we are saying that we do not save ourselves. God saves us. He himself saves us, and he saves us both completely and eternally. Now, when you sit down and really think about it, the mind just boggles at what God has done for us. That he would put his own son to death in order for rebellious, evil sinners like us is just beyond our comprehension. Surely it is too fantastic, too unbelievable to be true. Have a look at Hebrews 11 verse 1. If you've spent any time in, in, in the Bible, these words will be familiar, with you, for, familiar to you. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, many of you can recite that verse off by heart. But just stop and look at it and read it again and read it slowly. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Can you explain exactly what those words are actually saying? No, you can't. And that is the whole point. That God would do for us what he did for us is too fantastic to fully understand and to truly believe it to be true is beyond our comprehension. God did do for you what the Bible teaches. And knowing that your own faith would never be strong enough to hold on to that truth, he has given you a gift. 
And the gift that is given you is the faith strong enough to believe it. That's why so many reject it. Because it makes no sense. That's why Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 calls the preaching of Christ crucified foolishness to those who don't believe. And he's right. How often do you hear, you don't believe all that, do you? When cynics say that, they're merely confirming Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 1 to be true. That's the foolishness of the unrepentant heart suppressing and denying the truth because of their unrighteousness. And that is why in order to truly believe it, we need a faith greater than we have in order to accept it. We need a supernatural faith to comprehend and hold on to the gospel message. And that is exactly what God has done for us. My weak faith and your weak faith will always let us down. We don't have it within ourselves to hold firmly onto God. So he holds on to us. He gives us the gift of faith to believe that what he says he will do for us, he will do. And this incredible, wonderful plan by which lost sinners are saved for all of eternity is God's plan from beginning to end. And make no mistake, he will see it through. He will complete what he has begun, regardless of what you might think or what you might feel. Philippians 1 verse 6, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Father, that you would do what you've done for us when we sit down and really contemplate and try to hold on to and understand that truth is beyond our comprehension. For Lord, we know how sinful we are. We don't want to plunge the depths of our hearts because we know what lies there. And your word calls us in our natural state, children of wrath, enemies of God, and we know that to be true. Despite the fact that we try to be the best people we can be. And we are desperately lost without you. And we thank you for the gospel message and the hope that it brings. That you did for us what you did at Calvary. And it is beyond our own understanding. And our own faith is too weak to hold on to that truth. And so you've given us the gift of faith. In order to truly understand that and to believe it. We thank you Lord that it's not about us holding on to you. It's about you holding on to us. And you are the same God yesterday, today and forever. And so we thank you for the promise that those who put their faith in Christ are saved and saved eternally. And we bless you for this precious gift of faith that you've given to us, your church. And in Jesus' name we give you thanks, Lord. Amen. Amen.